Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. So I've been writing and thinking a lot about language recently. And I find language one useful window into this question. Because if one looks at the sweep of human history, you fairly quickly realize that for most of humanity, for most of human history, culture, politics, society has been something that wasn't to do with them, that was done on their behalf by a tiny number of people. We've had some form of writing for about 5,000 years. We've only had mass literacy in global terms for about the last half century. Silence and darkness are the defining norms of human history. And yet, just in the last couple of decades, we've got up to next year, we will have about one mobile phone for each one of the seven billion people on the planet. We've suddenly reached a stage of mass participation in written and recorded and official culture, and in mass participation through screens, which are, by definition, interactive. And this mass articulacy is an astonishing thing, and it becomes more astonishing the more I think about it, because really for the first time in the history of humanity, we don't have a small number of people speaking on behalf of everybody else. When I look even at Twitter, even at a hashtag, which doesn't necessarily involve as many people as you might think, 16% of the UK population, far less of most other countries, nevertheless, it feels like overhearing the world thinking to itself and performing publicly. It's very interesting to look at the short history of technology. If you look at the stories people were telling about tech, the start of the 20th century and then at the dawning of the internet era, we were worried that people would be sucked away from the real into the virtual. E.M. Forster wrote a, a story called The Machine Stopped about people isolated from each other. In the film The Matrix, we worried about being you know, brains in pods cut off from the real world. And in fact, really that was a false consciousness because it's the mobile screen. It's augmentation rather than substitution. It's the constant supply of data and metadata. We don't want to be brains in jars or people in pods. It's boring. It's no fun. We'd rather come to the RSA or go to Glastonbury. We just want our phone to be there, always on, always providing that layer of connectivity and articulacy and participation in mass discourse. And this is extraordinarily powerful. And it's extraordinarily intimate. I go on the tube in London, sadly. Uh, lots, of, lots of other people do as well. And I often find that I'm touching them. And, and I'd rather not be, but I don't have any choice about that. We're all like this. But it occurs to me that it would be far more violating of contemporary protocol for me to reach out and touch the screen of someone else's phone and jiggle my finger around than it would be for me to merely brush against any part of their body. It's totally unacceptable to fiddle with someone else's smartphone. They are the first thing many of us touch when we wake up in the morning, the last thing we touch when we go to bed at night. My wife and I sometimes lie in bed cradling our screens. And I'm not saying that's a sign there's something wrong in our relationship. <laughs> but it's a powerful index of a change in what we think ourselves to be and what we think it means to be involved in society. Uh, what's your kind of view of this, this, this conundrum of everything changing and nothing changing? I mean, if I, if I say to you, I'm, I'm of an age where I am pre-technology as well as post-technology, and I'm actually coming up through education. So I, I see this in, in helping run Apps for Good, but I also started, despite the accent, it's an American accent, but I've been for the last 20-some years in UK education. If, if I see the way that and trying to describe a pathway, it's, it's not dissimilar from, from what you're describing. I think characteristics of about what have happened in technology is, is the proliferation that's occurred, the um, democratization, 
and then the connectivity. You, you cannot find a, a school in the UK now or within, I would say, the developed world where technology is not a part of the lives, maybe not the education, but the lives of both the students and the teachers. And that proliferation is really important. And it's an exciting time because it is becoming something that we accept is a tool. It's not going away. So what are we going to do with it? When I talk about the democratization, education, information, but also, most excitingly, tools are being democratized. Gone are the times when a few people held the education and the power and the knowledge. Gone are the times in which the technology was the purvey of a few. And quite excitingly, gone is the time in which technology, the tools were only the pits of those great bards, the geeks, whoever could run that. We're now at a point with open source, with tools, where young people, as young as 11, can start to create and build tools and connect into that world. And that democratization is powerful and it means that education innovation can happen at a rate that never we could never have dreamt and the connectivity means that the usual barriers within education that that were there and that adults had a certain role and young people had a role and and policy and government sat one place and and businesses and industry and experts sat another those walls are coming down and for good or ill, that connectivity is here. Now, we see that there's an appetite there. We have experts within our community who want to work with young people and adults who are there. And then when you think about, you put those things together. If you look at the three elements I was talking about, what we do in Apps for Good is we work with schools and we deliver a course where teachers teach young people the whole process that means they can find a problem or an issue that they care about that they can then go through the process to understand how they could find a solution, use technology as a tool, not as a, not as a magic answer to things, but as another tool but that they can use to create those solutions. And at the moment, that's through smartphone apps. In, in five years' time, we might look back and say, what a quaint idea, smartphone apps, et cetera. But at the moment, young people can do that. What's your kind of view of this, this, this conundrum of everything changing and nothing changing? I think, you know, I, I would say I do absolutely. I'm a pragmatic optimist. I think the risk is there that those who, those haves and have nots get it and don't get it and that gap could widen. But I do think within education, within young people, that proliferation, that democratization and that, that connectivity, because we have experts who are desperate to work with young people to create those solutions, mean we are at an exciting time. It may be, whether it's the most of all times, I don't know, I'm not Voltaire, I'm not gonna imagine this is the best of all possible worlds. But I do think we have an opportunity. If we can get in front of it as a society, as educators, changing that dynamic, it's no longer one expert, one power at the front, but where we shift that power, embrace those technologies rather than fighting it or ignoring it, some incredibly powerful innovation can come. And far from the riots that we can see happening in different countries, if we allow people to be part of those tools and that moving forward, it's, it's an exciting time. I'm just fascinated by the idea of, has technology, has the internet rewired our brains? Has it actually changed, changed us? Is if I was summarising what Tom said, it would be kind of humanity 2.0, but we're not quite yeah. sure what that's going to be, in yeah. a way. Because I've, I've got a friend who's always complaining about how, you know, the Twitter feed that he's always reading means that he can never get through a thousand word article or a three thousand word article. You know, he can never read a book. He reads um, novellas, the short, sort of short form books. And, uh, I mean, how many people in this room would say that they think they have been changed by technology, that their human nature has been changed in some way? Put your hand right up in the air, that's a lot of them, right? Those who are utterly unchanged. <laughs> yep, we'll change you the yeah. <laughs> I think that's about kind of five to one. Yeah. But it's, I mean, that's a fascinating thought that, you know, our use of this technology, are, I mean, what's happened just in the, the backdrop of our lives so far, the, the rise of the web, the rise of the always on, the rise of the, the network between us. I think that's the big difference between the dark ages of history, as you um, mentioned, Tom, and, and what we've got today, which is this connectivity between every single human being. Um, well, every single human being who has access to the internet, which is, I think, what, two or three billion? It's nowhere near uh, enough um, of, of everybody. Uh, and I think that's the sort of the amazing thing is that we, you know, we are always connected to each other. We've got a problem because it's also new. It's not, we're not monetizing. There's no, you know, it's this great, amazing technology, but is it empowering people? Uh, I had someone say the other day that Kodak employed 140,000 people in decent 
jobs that paid well and provided a pension, Instagram uh, employ 14. And it makes no money. And the, you know, the whole model of uh, an internet business nowadays is something that will, will raise investment and then will exit after three years and not, uh, not actually drive, make any profit, not actually make any money, not actually create any long-lasting value. Uh, so I think there's a whole wealth of things, a whole um, area of things uh, bound up in this. Uh, ultimately, I think the web is the most transformative invention ever, uh, certainly since Gutenberg's printing press, because it gives publishing a new element of, of interactivity. And, uh, as a, you know, it's an interactive medium. And I think that people who have access to that and people that can publish stuff on the web um, and who just use the web and get it, um, which unfortunately isn't everybody, and that's the problem about you know, that, that inoculation against um, being scared of technology, let's say. People who do know how to do it are empowered, fundamentally empowered. And that's where we would, should be aiming to get everybody. And then we should all bring our humanity to that and say, actually, no, I, I want to do a business here. I'm not just going to um, do a startup and uh, not, make, you know, not do anything. I'm, if you, you know, that you're the guardian. I'm not gonna, just going to not monetize and give away our journalism for free. Um, and so there's a whole raft of issues out there which I find absolutely fascinating. So if you look at a, a new technological device, you know, a Samsung Galaxy, whatever it might be, and it gives you immense individual capacity, yeah? But, as Tom implied, things have happened which, had we been asked about them before they'd started, we probably wouldn't have agreed to. So you know, if, I had, if, I'd, if you'd all been sitting in this room 20 years ago and I'd said, how do you feel about an American corporation knowing more about you than you know about yourself, indeed knowing things about you that you'd really rather that nobody knew about you, including your partner, you'd have said, this is Orwellian, the idea that a corporation would have that much, but that's the world we now live in. Um, if I'd said to you, uh, how about a world in which children, very young children, and it's almost impossible to do anything about it, are able to access the most hardcore, bizarre pornography on their mobile phones, and there's nothing you can do about it, just hope that they can kind of survive it with. You'd say, no, 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 we need to do something about that. But the problem is, whether or not we want to do something about it, we probably can't. So the question then, I'll start with you, Debbie, is this, how do we deal with this world in which, as Tom said, these unintended consequences happen, which can lead to fundamental shifts but they're just inherently unpredictable. There's, now, it, doesn't, that in, doesn't that actually mean a pretty massive loss of, of human agency in the end? We're losing control here. I think I'm going to be the, the optimist tonight because I do think there's an opportunity. All of the questions you asked, I would say, could be reframed other times, but perhaps technology allows us to ask those questions. Perhaps there are other times in which there were organizations, agencies who knew a great deal but we didn't live in a situation where we would ask those questions. I think there's a democratization where the individual can question the larger organizations and corporations. To say that there were never in society big entities that had a power access to individuals is, is naive. That goes back as, as long as there are time. I think what's interesting is that technology and the way in which technology we are interacting with it means that that dynamic is more fluid than it has been in the past. You know, I don't think there's anything within society that is utterly deterministic. This is inherently good, this is inherently bad. I think it's always down to the societies, the organizations, the individuals who then use it. We could have, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago, if there was a dynamic, had the same discussion about, about fire, about Gutenberg, et cetera. I think technology is a catalyst that speeds things up and slows things down. And our role as humans and thinking individuals within that is to try and understand it as quickly as possible and to be those thinking, creative individuals who harness it for hopefully things that are positive for that society. I think one of the dangers of being too deterministic about these things is actually letting some blameworthy, nasty people off the hook. And when one's talking about something <coughs> sorry, that is, that is too big to fail and too complex to reform, that does start to sound a bit like something like Google. It probably is too big to fail. They're great now, they're lovely people, but in 25 or 35 or 55 years' time, they might well not be. And I think we can't let people off the hook. We can't say there is a logic in technology that's making this stuff happen. These are particular business models, particular decisions with particular consequences, not all of which we can foresee. I do think it, on behalf of technology, because it is just a tool and it is about educating, 
throughout time, and even when I was growing up, there was a sense that there were great forces, great companies, great politics, and that was out there, and that was inevitable, and how could the average person change it? And I think what has changed through technology is the individual can make an enormous impact. And I think technology has allowed that amplification and, and time condensation that means an individual can change things. And I think that goes back to education as well. Through the use of social media, through the, the things, we've seen how one or two whistleblowers can't be stopped by huge organizations. That, that individual questioning of, is this right, hang on a minute, is actually made easier, just as it may be possible for big corporations to become bigger and perhaps more evil. But I think the power of, of, of the David to the Goliath is also amplified, and that's where the education comes on, how we can all see there is a tool, there is a way in to shape that and change that and remain an even more powerful part of that dialogue. I think we're all always going to be human. We're not going to be changed radically by technology. We're always going to have our humanity, and we can always use that moral, co moral compass that we all have to, to make decisions. Um, the idea of there being people who are left out and not engaged with technology and the people who are like totally with it so much so that it's their religion, um, I think that that doesn't need to be the case. I think through education and just not even through like learning practical hands-on skills, just through learning about it and, and being, uh, having an interest in it and just understanding how things fit together, you can very quickly be kind of totally confident and comfortable living in the digital world. Think, uh, you know, in a million years' time, what's the technology going to look like? We're going to be smoking electronic cigarettes on spaceships, you know, because uh, we obviously couldn't smoke real cigarettes on spaceships. Uh, and, you know, whether we're even, whether we're even still here, um, I think it's just an incredibly exciting time to be, to be alive. The digital revolution is happening now, and, you know, it's only just beginning on the, on the scale. You know, in our lifetimes, in the last 20 years, it's kind of happened. Um, and this is just the beginning, so it's a very exciting time. Debbie? I think the next revolution is something that comes as an offshoot. You know, one thread that's come through is technology is driving back and causing questions to be raised about very central things. Monetization. How does economy work? What does business mean? How does that fit within morality? Um, we've seen through things like Arab Spring the issue, and we're, we're seeing in a number of countries the whole issue of how does a government represent a people, and we're forming different tribes and different affiliations and that sense of power. I think the next revolution is with the, with the, the ground rock that we will have of technology. It is going to allow us to ask questions of our very basic institutions of, of where, are, where is power. Who is it? Is it the state? Is it business? Is it something else? Is it the people? And I think, you know, the very, our foundations of our institutions will be questioned, be it education, be it business, be it government. And our ability to engage the have-nots will determine whether that is anarchy or that is a really exciting, positive, glorious revolution that we can have and that we can come through. So I, I think it is a point that is neutral and we can decide. We can master the wave, ride the wave and be great surfers, or we can just be overwhelmed by that. Um, we were talking about adaptation and people adapt to technology, which is absolutely true. But uh, for me, and I'm unused to being a Grinch, but <laughs> adaptation to technology has traditionally involved the deaths of enormous numbers of people or terrible things happening. And I'm not get saying that's what's going to happen, but I think part of our future is going to inevitably, as it always done, does, contain crises. We're going to become wise after events. The question is, how wise can we become and after which events? We had a, a reference to Plato's Phaedrus earlier, where he, ironically enough, on the written word, critiques the problems of writing. The point is not that Plato was being daft. The point is he was right. We lost a lot. Oral culture died. Oral culture is gone. We lost a lot with it. We have rubbish memories now, for example. We are in a unique position because of the incredible speed of the changes surrounding us. We have one foot in a past and one foot in an unimagined future that's going on right now around us. It's unevenly distributed, as William Gibson said. And I think where I'm optimistic is in our ability to think critically about the design of technologies and to ask these questions. And I think we need a lot more of that. We need school kids sitting around and just saying, let's think critically about Facebook. What's it making me do? Is this good or bad? Is it the best it could be? Because, and this is the crucial thing, none of the technologies are the best they could be. They're not some kind of Panglossian perfection where everything is marvelous. Everything is fallible. Everything is limited. Everything could be better. And if we can ask intelligently enough how these systems could be better, 
then there is a lot to be hopeful about.